Hi everyone! In this video, I'll be showing you object-oriented programming with Java and processing. This uh, content is going to build off of a lot of the content that was covered in the previous videos in this series, uh, so I do recommend starting with those other videos first. So what is object-oriented programming? Object-oriented programming is a paradigm that relies on classes, which are blueprints for a type of object. Uh, classes have attributes, which are things that we know about that type of object, and they also have methods, which you can think of as the behaviors those type of objects would have. Uh, what things can those objects do? Then we have an object, which is an instance of a class. So an object would have specific details filled in for its attributes. I'm going to start with a really simple demonstration using a class for a cat. So a cat could be a type of object that has attributes like its fur color, the length of its fur, is it short hair or long hair, and its size. Uh, and size, we could talk about different uh, units that we're using for the size. I'm going to just use the height of the cat in inches to represent the size. Um, and then the methods, this is what the, what the behaviors are of the cat. So we could have some methods like meow, run, or eat. These are some things a cat might do. I am just going to start with meow to keep things simple. Um, but this just, just gives you an idea of how methods and attributes would work for a cat class. Once we have our class written, or we have our blueprint for our type of object, we could make an instance of a cat. We could name it Mittens, and then we could specify its attributes. We could say that Mittens has gray fur, uh, its fur length is short hair, and its size is 10 inches tall. So here I am in processing, and I'm starting with an empty sketch this time. I don't have a setup or a draw function. And instead, what I'm first gonna do is I'm going to click on this little down arrow here, and click the new tab button. This allows me to make a new file in my project. And if we open up the folder that this project is in, we'll see now it will have more than one sketch file in it. Um, so I'm going to create a name for this new file. I'm going to call it cat, and this is going to be the file that will hold our cat class. So uh, I've made now a, a file for this, and so now I need to create the actual class. So I'm gonna create a cl class called cat and open curly bracket and close curly bracket. No parentheses, so the, the class does not need parentheses. It is not like a function. Um, however, uh, we will have some functions inside of this cat class. Um, but before I get to any of those, I wanna start with the attributes. So we talked about having a attribute for the fur color, the fur length, and the size of the cat. Um, I'm going to say that the fur color is a string called fur color. Uh, I will also use a string for the fur length, which will probably be short hair or long hair. And then I will use an int for the size of the cat. Now inside of this class, we are going to have some behaviors for the cat. Um, and like I said, these are called methods. They actually look exactly the same as functions and really the only difference is whether or not it belongs to a class. Um, but before we write any of our behaviors, we actually need something that will allow us to create an instance of a cat. And this is a special method or function which is called a constructor. And we use the name of the class and we take any uh, par parameters in parentheses that we want to use to specify the attributes when we are setting up a cat. So for example, um, if I want to, when I'm creating a new instance of a cat, I probably want to know its starting color, starting fur length, and starting size. Um, Probably the cat is not going to change color over time. However, cats, if you start with a kitten, they do grow over time. So we might be able to change the size over time. Um, but we want to start with the, some initial values that we'll set up. So I am going to take some parameters. I'll take a string C. Uh, I'm just gonna use single letters for the, the parameters that I'm taking in here. Uh, I will use, uh, so C is for color, L will be for fur length and int s for size. And notice that this does not start with void. The constructor does not start with a with void because it's actually um, creating an instance of this cat object to return. So um, now inside of here, um, we need to uh, use these parameters that we're passing and update the attributes accordingly. So for color, 
will be equal to C for length will be equal to L and size will be equal to S. Next we're going to add our first method for the cat's behavior and I'm going to do the meow method. Uh, just like with a function, we could start with the keyword void to say that it does not return anything, or we could return something. Um, and in my previous video, when I demonstrated functions, I didn't show how to return a value. So I'll go ahead and show that now. So let's say we're going to return a string value from this method. And as I said, the method is called meow. I won't take any parameters for the method. Uh, but when we have a return type, if you hover over the method or function name, it will say must return a result. And so we need to add a return statement. Um, so I could do other things in this method before returning, uh, but this is actually a pretty simple method. So I am just going to return something here. I'm going to return a string and the string is going to say the plus for color, so I'm concatenating here. Uh, the plus sign allows us to concatenate multiple strings together. So for color is a string, which I'm concatenating to the. Uh, so for example, if I pass gray as the fur color, it would fill in gray here. So it would say the gray cat is meowing. Um, so whatever is the fur color of the instance of the cat, when this method is called, it will pull from that attribute and uh, include that in the return statement. So now we have our cat class set up. And so now we want to use this cat class and make some objects or instances of the cat class. So I'm gonna go back to my main file and I am going to make a new variable at the top. And normally when we're creating a new variable, we start with a data type like int or string. Uh, but now that I have a class, I actually have a new data type that I can work with. This, this cat class is a type. And so I can make a variable of type cat. Uh, and I'm going to make a cat called mittens. So this is my variable name equals new cat. Uh, this new keyword um, says that it's going to use the constructor of our cat class. So this cat is going to reference this cat constructor and we need to pass it some information and what we need to pass it needs to match the parameters that this constructor is looking for. So it's looking for a string, another string, and an int. So I'm going to pass it the color gray as a string short hair, so this will be a short haired cat, and the size will be 10. Now it's giving me a squiggly line under cat saying it doesn't exist. I actually need to add my draw function to make this recognized as the main, uh, the main class file so that it can reference other classes. Um, so now that squiggly line is gone, uh, and I am going to use the draw function in just a moment to do something with this information. So I now have an instance of a cat uh, called mittens, which is a created using the cat constructor with gray, short hair, and 10. I also want to go ahead and save this, uh, these two sketches together so that it creates a new project folder that will contain both of these files. So I'm going to choose save as, and I'm going to call this cat OOP or OOP, uh, Object Oriented Programming, frequently uh, abbreviated as OOP. And so I will save that. And it changes the file name up here. And now if I browse to my processing folder, I can open up that project folder, cat OOP. And here I can see both files are here. So once you start creating uh, separate files with classes in them, you will see multiple files appear in your project folder. So now I want to do something in my draw function using this meow method from my cat class. So with my instance of my cat named mittens, I want to call the meow method on mittens. Uh, so I'm going to add a if condition to check if the mouse is pressed. So this will only happen when I click. And so when I click, what I want to do is print line 
and I want to print the result of the meow method on my instance mittens. So to do that, what we do is the name of the instance mittens dot and then the name of the method. In this case, it is meow with an open and close parentheses and then close parentheses for the print line and a semicolon. Now when I run this and click in my window, I can see the gray cat is meowing. It does print several times because it's printing the whole time my mouse is being held down. So if I hold it down for a while, I can see I have a lot of them being printed out. Uh, but you can see how this is calling the method of uh, the cat and it is using the instance mittens. And so you can see the gray cat. Uh, so it is using this gray color that I am initializing mittens with. So mittens is being created with the fur color gray. For the rest of this video, I'm going to be working in uh, the project that I worked on in a previous video where I showed how to take keyboard input and use the arrow keys to move a rectangle around the screen. Uh, so what we have here in this previous demo is a square that I move around using the arrow keys. And the way that we implemented this was using a uh, change X or DX and change Y or DY for Delta X and Delta Y and a speed. And then in our draw, we're updating the X and Y coordinates of the rectangle uh, based on that change in X and change in Y, which is specified using the key pressed function and the key released function. So um, you can, if you followed along uh, previously, you can work in that project or you can go back to that video to see how we got to this point. So what we're going to add to this is a new file for a class that is going to be um, something that we can collect. So we're moving a rectangle around and let's say when we uh, run into something, we want to collect it. So uh, I'm just going to call this coin. So we'll make a coin class and we will give it some attributes. Uh, so some important things we're going to need to know about each coin is um, its X and Y position. So we know where to draw it on the screen and um, we'll also be collecting the coin. So we're going to want a Boolean value keeping track of whether or not the coin is active or not. So I'm going to make a float for coin X and float for coin Y. These will be the X and Y positions of the coin and then a Boolean called active. Then I need to, just like we did with the cat class, I need to make a constructor, which is going to take a, um, a X and Y value to store for the coin X and Y. And we do not need to take the Boolean value because we are going to set that to false by, or to, to true by default. So by default, it will be active and then we'll set it as inactive once it is collected. So uh, we'll do an X position and a Y position. And then inside of this constructor, we will specify that our coin X equals X pose and our coin Y equals Y pose. And we will set our active Boolean to true. Now, uh, I mentioned before uh, that when you start creating functions, um, it's common to have an update function or an update method for different things that you have in your sketch or in your scene. Um, so we're going to give a method called update to this coin. So we'll do void update. It doesn't need to return anything and it doesn't need to take any parameters. So this update method, we will call update on our coin and it will update drawing the coin on the screen. And we need to do that only if it is still active. So I'm going to say if active and we'll specify a fill color. I'm going to make it sort of a yellow orange color. So we'll do 200, 220. And then we'll draw a circle. And the position of our circle is going to be coin X and 
coin Y. And the size of our circle, let's just do 20. All of our coins will be the same size, so we don't need an attribute for the coin size. If we wanted to have coins that were different sizes, then we might want an attribute to keep track of that. Next, let's make instances of our coin. And to do this, we are going to rely on something that we learned in one of the previous videos about arrays and loops. So I'm actually going to make an array of coins. So the type of our array is coin, and we use the square brackets to say that it is an array. And I'll call this coins. And we'll say this is a new array of coin that will have 10. So it will have 10 coins in the array. Then in our setup, we need to um, create each of these coins that is going to be in our array and specify the position that we want to instantiate them at. Uh, so I'm going to add int i equals zero, just like we did when we used a while loop before. So we will do while i is less than 10. And make sure it's very important we always uh, update an, our incrementer so i plus plus before we update it we are going to uh, do coins of i so we use i as the index in our array and for each of these we will say this is a new coin and so this is our coin uh, constructor so our coin constructor is looking for two values an x value and a y value and so I'm going to pass it an x value I'm going to give it actually a random x value between 0 and the width of the screen and then for the y value I will also do random between 0 and the height of the screen and in that line with a semicolon. And so now what this is doing is, is looping through uh, i from zero up to nine, and it is going to the um, coins array at that index, and it is creating a new coin at a random position. So now we need to uh, add into our draw function to actually draw the coins. And so after call to background, I am going to add in here a for loop that is going to loop through all of my coins in the array called coins. And for each of these coins, we are going to say c.update. So we are calling the update method on each of the coins. So this update method, again, is this update call right here. So that is what is going to draw the coin on the screen. And if we test this right now, we should see now all of our coins are on the screen. Now, one problem is I'm at, I actually was never setting a fill color before for my uh, rectangle, so I probably want to go ahead and add uh, a, a fill color for my rectangle so that my rectangle is a different color from my coins. Um, now also my rectangle is very large compared to the coins and also compared to the screen that I am playing in. Uh, so it might be a good idea to reduce the size of the rectangle. Um, and one of the things that I want to do uh, right here is actually to um, make a, a variable for the width and the height of the rectangle rather than continuing to have to update these numbers. So I am going to add up at the top uh, an int for my width. And before it was, um, I think, 80. Uh, and yeah, so 80 and 80 for my width and height. So I'm going to take that down um, to, let's say, 40 for my width and height. I'm keeping these separate just in case I want to turn this into a rectangle instead of a square at some point. Um, <clears throat> so now, um, everywhere that I was using 40, I am going to use either width over 2 or height over 2, um, and then 80 will become width and height. Um, and so here's another 40, so this is W over 2, and this one is H over 2. And where else did I have it? This one will be H over 2. And this 40 is also 
h over 2 and this one is w over 2. Um, I think that's everywhere I needed to change it so let's just run that and make sure. Okay so now my square is much more reasonably sized and I still can't cross over outside the edges. So um, perfect. So now we should probably go ahead and make our coins collectible. Uh, so I'm going to go into the coin class and I'm going to add a new method called collect, which will be, uh, we will call this whenever we need to collect a coin. And so I'm going to add a, a new variable called collected that will be the total number of coins that I've collected. So, uh, and I'm going to increment that when I collect a coin. Now, I don't want to store this in the coin. The coin should not be the thing keeping track of how many coins have been collected. So we want this to be in our main class. Uh, so I'm going to add up at the top, int collected equals zero. Um, and now if I go back to my coin file, now it's no longer getting the squiggly line because this is a uh, global variable that I'm declaring at the top of my file. So I can access this from inside of my other classes. So even though this collected variable does not exist in here, it, it is accessible um, because it is uh, created up here at the top of my file. So uh, now I, uh, I add one to this variable called collected. I am also going to go ahead and print out this number, however many I have collected at this point. Um, and I'm going to set active equal to false. So now um, this active Boolean that I was using to keep track of whether or not the coin has been collected. Now when I get in here into this update, it's going to check if it is active. And if it has been collected, active will be false. So it will not draw the coin. Uh, so also while I am inside of this uh, update method, um, after I draw the coin, uh, so if it is active, I draw the coin and then uh, I want to find out if my rectangle has collided with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a distance check. I'm going to check the distance between x, uh, the x and y coordinates of my rectangle. That's this x and y here. Um, so this x and y is being updated uh, every every frame when I move the when I use the arrow keys. So the arrow keys is updating my x and y value. So this x and y value is the rectangle. Um, and so if I check the distance between this x and y to the coin x and y value. So we have coin x and coin y. So we're going to check if this distance is less than, uh, let's do half the width of the square. So um, my square that I'm moving around, I'm going to check if the distance is half. Um, so this doesn't need to be perfect. We talked before about um, checking the distance between uh, uh, the mouse cursor to a circle versus with a square. And we noticed how the corners of the square were being ignored. Um, so this particular distance check, this does not need to be perfectly accurate for what we're testing out right now. So I'm just going to keep this simple. Um, but we could get very specific about detecting each edge uh, of the square and checking that edge to the center of the circle or to the edge of the circle. Uh, but just to keep it pretty simple, um, we're going to say we're just looking for the straight distance between the two. And if it is within that distance, oops, then we will call the collect method. So that is this method that we just wrote down here. So um, if uh, so we draw the, the circle, uh, if it is active, we draw it and then we check if it is colliding with the square. If so, we call the collect method and we up, update our collected uh, counter and then we set that coin to not active. So let's go ahead and test this and see. And remember to click on your window. It doesn't accept if you don't click on the window. Um, okay, so now I can see when I run into the coins. Um, so here I can see I might want to um, increase the, the distance check because um, it does go over the, the coin a fair amount. 
Um, so I think I probably want to add the size of the coin or half of the size of the coin um, to my distance check. So um, you can see I can't collect this one here in the corner. Uh, so instead of W over two, I'm going to add to this um, the size of the coin or half the size of the coin. So the coin is 20 and so I'm going to add 10. Uh, the 20, the size, this is the diameter of the circle and so I only want to be checking uh, adding to it the radius of the circle. All right, so now it is uh, not overlapping so much, so it is collecting pretty much right away. And so I am able to collect all of the coins. Um, now I can see it, it is printing down here in the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, so I should have been using print LN, so it's printing these on separate lines. Um, also make sure to save your work from time to time, control S on Windows or command S on a Mac so you don't lose your work. Um, and so now when I run this, uh, now my coins are being collected. And it is accurately updating the numbers down here in the bottom. So when I come to collect this last one, now the last number is 10. Uh, so uh, that covers object-oriented programming with processing and Java. So now you know how to add classes, which are templates, to your projects and then create instances of those classes within your main file. Uh, there are a lot more complex things you can do with this, which I will cover in some of the future videos. Thanks for watching.